Chapter 7, Good Roads, Bicycle Mechanics, and Horseless Carriages. I often hear nowadays, the automobile instigated good roads, that the automobile is the parent of good roads. Well, the truth is, the bicycle is the father of the good roads movement in this country. Horatio Earl, Father of Good Roads, 1929. 7.1, Bicycles as Building Blocks. The Velocipede, developed in France in the 1850s and 1860s, might be considered the first true bicycle. The front high-wheeler, or ordinary, evolved into the more modern-looking safety bicycle with two equal-sized wheels, making bicycling more popular. In addition to being a significant mode in its own right, and driving ladies' fashion toward the bloomer, the bicycle enabled the automobile. The bicycle gave the automobile a head start on pneumatic tires, ball bearings, paved roads, developing a set of manufacturers and mechanics who could adapt their skills to more complex automobile, and democratizing both touring and personal transport in cities. One of those manufacturers was Colonel Albert Pope, 1843-1909, who acquired a number of European patents. His Columbia bicycles were manufactured in Hartford and distributed nationally via the U.S.'s new railroad system and marketed via new popular magazines distributed by the post office, beginning in the late 1870s. Though prices dropped to $100 in nominal terms, they were still quite expensive. Pope convened 31 independent cycling clubs and helped organize the League of American Wheelmen, which advocated for good roads on which to ride bicycles. Pope's firms in 1897 exploited their bicycle knowledge of tubular steel to build the first mass-produced automobile, the Columbia Electric Phaeton. Mark III, a relatively light carriage, 800 kilograms, of which 385 kilograms were battery and also adapted metal-spoked wheels and pneumatic tires from bicycles. The Durio brothers, Charles, 1861-1938, and Frank, 1869-1967, were also bicycle mechanics interested in the automobile, developing the first U.S. gasoline engine to run well in Springfield, Massachusetts. Frank won the first auto race with one of their cars, and the Durios were the first commercially produced motor vehicles in the United States, turning out 13 in 1896. Ironically, perhaps, the first auto crash involved a Duria in New York City, driven by Henry Wells, not the founder of of Wells Fargo, hitting a Columbia bicycle ridden by Evelyn Thomas on May 31, 1896. The most well-known bicycle mechanics to turn their attention elsewhere were, of course, the Wright brothers, who we'll meet later. This chapter examines the proto-automobile truck highway system around the turn of the 20th century. The bicycle was not the only antecedent to the modern automobile, The development of gasoline, steam, and electric engines are quite important, but the emergence of good public roads first came about due to avid bicyclists seeking a network who were followed by even more avid auto users. By the turn of the 20th century, there was a built-out but mostly unpaved road system that were building blocks for the auto, truck, highway system that followed. Seven point two from horse to horseless. Young man, that's the thing. You have it. Keep at it. Electric cars must keep near to power stations. The storage battery is too heavy. Steam cars won't do either, for they have to have a boiler and a fire. Your car is self-contained, carries its own power plant, no fire, no boiler, no smoke, and no steam. You have the thing. Keep at it. Thomas Edison talking to Henry Ford in 1896. The automobile had long been forecast. Chapter 1 noted some of the early, often amusing attempts with steam cars. During the late 19th century, the steam engine had been adapted from railroads to farm equipment, including a self-propelled steam tractor. Yet the gestation period for the automobile lasted over a century. In the 1890s, Indianapolis had one horse for every 14 people, while Kansas City faced 7.4. The peak year for horses in England was 1901, which saw 3.25 million, more than a century after the onset of the Industrial Revolution and 75 years after the Iron Horse. By 1924, there were fewer than 2 million. The cost of maintaining a horse combined with its lesser efficiency doomed this mode to be replaced by motorization. The electric cars, too, had early prototypes. In 1835, Thomas Davenport of Vermont built the first rotary electric motor and found many uses, including a toy train, later pulling 31 to 36 kilogram pound carriages at 5 kilometers per hour. In the late 1830s, Robert Davidson of Scotland built a carriage powered by batteries and a motor, and later an electric coach, the Galvani, running on rail tracks. In 1851, 
Charles Page built an electric locomotive reaching a speed of 30 kilometers per hour on a run outside of Washington, D.C. All of these were important but false starts. The electric car was technically feasible but economically impractical given the relative costs of energy generation, transmission, and storage. The electric grid, developed by Edison and others, was necessary for practical electrical transportation. Electricity was first applied in transport to the streetcar. The year 1879 saw Siemens and Halski build a 2.6 kilometer line in Berlin. Battery trolleys were tested in the early 1880s in places like the Leland Avenue Railway in Philadelphia. By 1887, a New York financial syndicate funded Frank Julian Sprague and his company, Sprague Electric Railroad and Motor Company, to build a 19.2 kilometer line in Richmond, Virginia for somewhat more than the $110,000 that was budgeted, a line that would be on the order of $1 billion in modern terms. Trolleys exploded across U.S. cities as is detailed in Chapter 8. The electric streetcar and other electric railways transmitted power to the vehicles via a cable. While tracks were not necessary, as later demonstrated by trackless rubber-tired electric trolley buses, batteries would be the key to enable electric transportation off the grid. Gaston Plant developed the first workable storage batteries in 1859, which were initially used for telegraphy and for scientific instruments. Camille Fair later thought to use it for load leveling of electric dynamos, and then filed a patent for a battery-powered vehicle. Fair's battery comprised pure lead plates coated with a paste of sulfuric acid and lead. Technical problems emerged when the paste separated. In 1888, Fair was issued a U.S. patent for recharging a battery when going downhill. 1893's World's Columbian Exposition displayed six automobiles. The only one from the United States, by William Morrison of Iowa, was electric. Yet the energy density of the battery remained the principal constraint on the electric vehicle's market share. By the turn of the century, range and the energy per unit weight of battery compared with gasoline engines were already defined as key weaknesses by the best engineering talent of the time. Battery-powered vehicles have more limited range, distance before recharging or refueling, than gasoline-powered vehicles due to energy density. The limits to battery technology result from battery weight. Each additional battery reduces the effectiveness of all the others, as they must spend some of their stored energy moving around other batteries instead of the rest of the car and passenger. Diminishing returns set in quickly. While longer distance touring was a relatively small market, people considered the extreme use for the vehicle they buy, not the average. A vehicle must be usable in a maximal number of conditions. People imagined traveling more than 100 miles in a day, something an electric could not do. Other problems were the underdeveloped electric grid. As late as 1900, only 5% of factory power was electric. And lack of charging stations, especially at homes. However, public lighting was a complement to the use of streets, and thus automobiles, at night. At home electrification in the late 1800s and early 1900s was limited. The first rationale was to replace gas lighting. Hence, sockets were the standard outlet and appliances had to plug into ceiling lighting sockets rather than the more common today wall outlet. Electricity's famous War of the Standards was fought pitting Westinghouse and Tesla's alternating current against Edison's direct current in the 1890s. While alternating current, AC, eventually won for electric distribution, direct current, DC, was simpler for charging cars. The 110-volt DC system could be plugged into a rheostat to adjust voltage, and then used to connect to the car battery. Overcharging was a risk, and so it was not quite a turnkey operation. In contrast, AC was more difficult, coupling an AC motor with a DC generator, along with a rheostat to match voltage. This was finally made available by Westinghouse as a consumer good in 1900. In any case, an enormous amount of power was lost as heat in this process. The plug to connect the car battery to the wall was not developed until 1901, Prior batteries had to be removed from vehicles, no trivial task. Electric utilities implemented time-of-day pricing to better balance peak loads. Some electric utilities, for example, Rockford, Illinois, which was DC-based, encouraged EVs and helped charge and maintain them at central stations, and did locally have an effect on EV sales. Most electric utilities saw these customers as nuisances rather than a source of business. Range, around 1901, was about four hours, so charging was a frequent event. Fast charging, one or two hours, deteriorated the batteries. The industry magazine, Electric World, predicted the time will come, and not very far in the future, when electric automobiles will furnish one of the most important sources of income to the electric lighting companies. A third strategy, a charging hydrant, dubbed an electrant, located every few blocks, 
would allow travelers to pull over and pay for a metered amount of electricity. This, however, was never deployed. These ideas have been regurgitated in the 1990s and 2000s as people seek to solve the same problems with electrics. Again, the number of charging stations remains quite limited, as no one wants to invest in a network of charging stations until there are many plug-in electrics requiring charges, and few will buy plug-in electrics if the cost and convenience does not match its technological competitors. Another concept, developed by L. R. Wallace in 1900, was to have a parent battery company from which batteries would be leased and then swapped out when needing recharging for already charged batteries. This idea has been revived with the company Better Place in the 2000s, which hoped to develop a network of battery exchange centers and deployed some in Israel, its home country, to service specially designed Renault vehicles. Unfortunately, this company failed. Similarly, electric garages modeled on livery stables for horses were established to limit the owner's need to deal with the difficulties of charging and maintaining the car. By 1899, there were a variety of automobile types on the road at different sizes, aimed at replacing markets for buggies, wagons, and carriages. Body styles were kept from horsepowered vehicles to avoid too much shock to potential buyers. Many different names were applied, runabouts for smaller open-air cars, brooms for larger enclosed vehicles, among others. In 1900, the United States produced 4,192 automobiles, 28% of which were electric. The dominant competing technologies at the time were steam, gasoline, and electric. Observers believed each would find niches, a sphere of action they would dominate. Electrics for the ladies, who needed to travel in town, gasoline for the longer distance trips, and so on. The automobile was not yet mass produced, and it was emerging in an environment where horse-drawn coaches, carriages, and cabs dominated the pre-automobile personal transport scene. An emerging middle class of urban professionals managers, and white-collar workers formed a market for a new type of transportation. The primary advantages of electric at the time had to do with the user interface. Charles Kettering had yet to develop the self-starter, so gasoline engines required the user to get out and crank. This was a non-starter for upper-income women who thus preferred electric vehicles. EVs were often marketed to women, but this feminizing of the product may have discouraged men. Mass-produced automobiles like the automobile sold 425 vehicles in 1900. The market was still minuscule, but growing exponentially. Detroit in 1900 was much like the Silicon Valley of the 1970s, with its homebrew computing club that begat Apple Computer and at Microsoft. In 1903, the first year of Ford's Model A, $750, Ford sold 1,708 vehicles. Old sold 4,000. By 1905, Ford rolled out a Model B for $2,000, C for 950, F for 1,200, and a doctor's car for 850. In 1906, a Model N for 600 and K for 2800. The company was trying to occupy a variety of market niches, but Ford soon developed what might be dubbed Henry's Law. Thou shalt make only one model, and that model was the Model T, and for Ford and his customers, it was good. By 1912, Model T sales reached 82,388. In 1914, 200,000. In 1915, 400,000. Though the Model T was originally available in other colors, to drive down costs, black became standard. Despite Edison's encouragement of Ford's gasoline-powered car, as noted in the opening quote of this section, later Edison and Ford worked together in a failed attempt to bring about an electric car that was competitive with gasoline-powered vehicles. In 1905, the 1,200 electrics sold were fewer than 10% of all vehicles sold. Ultimately, EVs fell farther and further behind, as economies of scale drove down the relative cost of its competitors, attracting a greater and greater share of consumers. Like internal combustion engines, ICEs, EVs were rising in sales, but at a much more modest pace, growing to only 6,000 vehicles in 1912. Electric trucks, ETs, had a better time than electric cars, as trucks had the advantage in many cases of fleet operation, and thus centralized maintenance and management. Electric trucks lasted longer, but that can be a disadvantage in a rapidly advancing field, as they would become functionally obsolete as newer, more modern gasoline or diesel-powered trucks took the road and make the ETs look and feel antiquated in comparison. Compare a mobile phone from today with one from five or ten years ago to get a sense of the rapidity of change. Edison and others experimented with alternative battery materials, as lead-acid batteries were heavy and had a low energy density. Other materials were technically better, but more expensive. Finding something less expensive with a higher energy density would be the key to solving the range problem. 
Because of the difficulty consumers had with charging, Salem and Morris of the electric storage battery ESB company proposed a fleet of rental cars and antecedent to car sharing where professionals could do charging and maintenance. Individuals would still rent or lease a particular car. However, this failed to get critical mass and required picking up the car rather than storing it at home. In the end, this became a fleet of cabs where instead of recharging batteries in the vehicle, they would be swapped in and out and charged slowly out of the vehicle. Owner of the New York's Metropolitan Street Railway Company, Henry Melville Whitney, consolidated the electric vehicle industry beginning in 1898, acquiring ESB, combining with Pope, and absorbing the Riker Company with the aim of establishing a fleet of 15,000 electric cabs to serve urban America. Whitney also purchased the Selton patent on gasoline-powered cars. This lead cab trust began to fail when the batteries, designed for smoother running streetcars or stationary operations, did not do well on bumpy road surfaces, and the frequent charging and discharging use of cab service rather than the more sedate private ownership. Batteries deteriorated with use more than simply age. The Edison Storage Battery Company aimed to develop a nickel-iron alkaline battery to replace the lead-acid battery. Edison's competitor, ESB, tried to perfect the lead-acid battery. The New York Electric Vehicle Transportation Company, part of EVC, the Lead Cab Trust, was probably the largest consumer of such batteries. It also developed its own central station and substation and started running electric buses on Fifth Avenue as well as other routes. Other subsidiaries of the trust fared less well. The New England and Illinois branches of EVTC folded in 1901. Edison hyped his battery for years, but it was not widely used once it came to market, as the cost-energy density trade-off never worked favorably. The internal combustion engine, ICE, was patented in 1860 by Belgian engineer Jean-Joseph Etienne Lenoir, who applied a coal gas and air burning version to his three-wheeled Hippomobile. Nicholas Otto developed his engine in the 1870s, and Carl Benz used Otto's engine to power a 600-watt, 8.8 horsepower, three-wheeled carriage in 1885. At the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, George B. Selden saw George Brayton's internal combustion engine and applied for a patent on an ICE-powered automobile in 1879. The Selden patent, issued 16 years after filing in 1895, was used as a hammer against competing makers of gasoline-powered autos who were required to license this patent. An association of licensed automobile manufacturers who were legally authorized to produce gasoline-powered cars was established. And licensees did not want unlicensed autos about, as they would drive down prices. Selden, widely criticized in histories of the automobile, has his defenders. For example, Byers in 1940, who argued Selden in fact did develop the gasoline-powered automobile in the United States before anyone else. To quote the decision sustaining the patent against Henry Ford and others who did not want to pay the license, quote, there was no such horseless carriage industry. The art existed only in talk and hope. A later court ruling did not overturn the patent, but ruled Ford's vehicle was not in violation. This came as the patent was winding down, approaching its 16th year in 1911, so had little effect. Charles Kettering developed the electric starter, which temporarily overloaded the motor. Interestingly, Kettering modeled his innovation on the self-starter with his work on motorizing the cash register when he was an engineer at National Cash Register in Dayton, Ohio. Kettering later founded the Dayton Engineering Laboratories Company, Delco, soon acquired by General Motors. The self-starter eliminated the disease of Ford's fracture, a broken arm resulting from cranking accidents. After Kettering, the automobile became an electric system in miniature. Its generator, with a battery, was the central station, which distributed current through a network to users like starting the car, but also for headlights and later radios and other purposes. Surprisingly, battery makers boomed not from selling batteries to makers of EVs, but from selling to makers of gasoline-powered cars containing an electric self-starter. Endosymbiosis in biology refers to the idea that organelles of eukaryotic cells like mitochondria and chloroplasts, were originally free-living microorganisms that combined symbiotically to mutual benefit. The internal combustion engine adopted the battery as a self-starter and as a technological version of this biological process. Hybrid vehicles, which ramp up the battery so that the vehicle can travel in either electric or gasoline-powered, are another version of this. Ferdinand Porsche built a hybrid in 1901. In 1905, Fisher Motor Vehicle Company developed an early gas-electric hybrid omnibus 
With an electric starter, the battery helped the gasoline engine in overload conditions. There were other early attempts, but nothing persisted in the marketplace. It wasn't until 1969 that General Motors began experiments with hybrids. Other automakers similarly experimented. In 1997, the Toyota Prius went on sale in Japan, and in 2000 in the United States, while the Honda Insight started sales in the U.S. in 1999. Electric vehicles would see a revival. 7.3 Road Trips and Races The Long Island Motor Parkway will supply an uninterrupted route across the island that, owing to its proximity to the metropolis, is destined to be the home of millions with business and social interests in New York City. Someday the state will supply such motorways. Automobile Magazine, 1908 Cars had several key properties. They could go farther than other private modes of transport, bikes and horses, and they could go faster. The way to demonstrate these properties was through various stunts. Long road trips, especially on pre-paved rural American byways, was one such class of venture. Road and off-road races were another. Some notable early American road trips are listed below. 1897, Alexander Winton, a bicycle dealer and automaker, drove from Cleveland to New York in his own creation. 1899, John and Louise Hitchcock Davis tried to go from San Francisco to New York in a durea but only made it to Chicago after three months and gave up. 1901, Alexander Winton again tried to go from San Francisco to Chicago, but gave up in Nevada. 1901, Roy Chapin took an Oldsmobile from Detroit to New York in just over a week. 1903, Horatio Nelson Jackson and Sewell K. Crocker from Burlington, Vermont, traveled from San Francisco to New York in 63 days, completing the first successful transcontinental car trip. This has been chronicled in the first book, in the book and documentary, Horatio's Drive. 1915, Transcontinental Film Convoy, a four-month trip to the Panama Pacific International Exposition to complete a film, three miles in length, sponsored by the Lincoln Highway Association. 1919, Motor Transport Corps Convoy, a truck train from Washington, D.C. to Oakland, California, which encountered 230 incidents, breakdowns of various sorts, and broke and repaired 88 wooden bridges. Lieutenant Colonel Dwight David Eisenhower participated. The speed of travel was 9.1 kilometers an hour for 573.5 hours. This illustrated the poor quality of U.S. roads. 1920, the Motor Transport Corps convoy, a truck train from Washington to San Diego on the Bankhead Highway, which departed June 14, 1920, and arrived October 2nd. This illustrated the especially poor quality of southern U.S. roads. After North America was conquered, promoting round-the-world races became a popular stunt. This was generally infeasible, and not just because of several oceans in the way. Early car demonstrations had races for speed as well as endurance. In 1896, at a Providence horseless carriage race, Riker Electric Motors won the prize with an electric that covered a mile in 2 minutes and 13 seconds. Second place went to an Electrobat running the fastest 5 miles in 11 minutes and 27 seconds. Racing was important for a variety of reasons. It was a public test of the ability of the vehicle. It was a thorough technological challenge. If a car could survive the stresses of the race, it would do better in real driving conditions than one which could not. Henry Ford took his car with the Detroit Automobile Company to a 1901 race at Gross Point, and driving it himself, won the race against an experienced racer Alexander Winton of Cleveland. Barney Oldfield, inspired by the 1900 New York Auto Show at the old Madison Square Garden, which he attended with his Indianapolis friend Carl Fisher, became the first famous race driver. Carl Graham Fisher, 1874 to 1939, was an auto dealer of multiple marks, Packard, Oldsmobile, Rio, but he was more than that. Fisher was a promoter and racer. Later in life, he would help develop Miami Beach. In a throwback to the race of the Tom Thumb, he would race his car for, against horses for money and win. Car races were increasingly popular in the 1910s and lethal to both drivers and fans. Oldfield wrecked his car, resulting in both injuries to him and death to a fan. The same day, a car of Fisher's also killed an onlooker. Fisher co-founder co-founded Presto Light using compressed acetylene for headlights. These soon became standard from the automakers, making Fisher, his friend James Allison, co-founder of what became Allison Transmissions, later part of General Motors, and inventor Percy Avery wealthy. Presto Light was purchased by Union Carbide in 1917. In 1908, with Allison and others, Fisher incorporated the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Its tar McAdams surface was dangerous under high speeds of racing, 
in the American Automobile Association threatened to withdraw its sanctioning of races. Still, by its third race, the racetrack had claimed three lives and many injuries. The tar surface was replaced with bricks and concrete walls, giving the track its Brickyard nickname. Within two years, the first Indianapolis 500 was held. The Long Island Motor Parkway, also called the Vanderbilt Parkway, was a private road built by William Kissam Vanderbilt, Commodore Vanderbilt's great-grandson. It was built as a turnpike. It was the first limited-access roadway running from Queens to Lake Ronkonkoma on Long Island, opening in part in 1908 and completed in 1911. The route was intended to be used for road races. The Vanderbilt Cup, since using existing roads for ra races, was deadly, which was run from 1908 to 1910. As the first limited access route, it was built to standards that would soon be considered inferior. Robert Moses constructed the Northern State Parkway in a competing right of way, and the state purchased the parkway in 1938 in lieu of back taxes, and it was shuttered. Parts have been converted to bicycle trails, electric transmission rights of way, and other parkways. Seven point four object lessons. The Good Roads Movement arose out of the efforts of the League of American Wheelmen, an association of state bicycle clubs formed by Hartford-based manufacturer Colonel Albert Pope. The League was the AAA, or cycle path, of its day, developing maps and recommending cycling routes for the recreational cyclist with user ratings. It had over 25,000 members by 1891. Pope used his funds to help the League establish the magazine Good Roads, which advocated for pavements and endowed a highway engineering course at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Justice Studebaker later endowed traffic safety programs at Harvard and Yale. The League opposed the Corvée statute labor system of working out the road tax, instead demanding professionally built, government-funded good roads. It encouraged allies from all areas, including farmers, engineers, manufacturers, and merchants. Farmers constituted an important part of the Good Roads Coalition, and they exerted pressure to improve the rural road system once they began to purchase and use automobiles and trucks. Cars and roads sharply imprinted rural activities as a new spatial arrangement of activities, market, recreation, religious, school, and so on, emerged. For instance, small local hamlets withered as commercial and social activities increased at larger centers. Rural residents claimed a right to an improved road system. Necessary governmental institutions were in place, township, county, and later state agencies, and technology, knowledge of how to construct roads and bridges, was available and or could be evolved. Authority and power were in place too, lending political interest and support. At the time, rural interests dominated the state and federal governments. However, money was a problem. Pope went on to start a lobbying organization, the National League for Good Roads. These efforts were soon followed at the federal level with the establishment in 1894 of an Office of Road Inquiry, ORI, in the U.S. Department of Agriculture, led by General Roy Stone, a Civil War veteran. Note that there was not yet a Department of Commerce, where the later Bureau of Public Roads would long be housed, nor a Department of Transportation, where the Federal Highway Administration would find itself. And the role of roads was seen as a largely rural to support agriculture and intercity commerce. The ORI funded demonstration projects, dubbed Object Lesson Roads, to illustrate the benefits of improvements. Ultimately, 410 such were Object Lesson Roads were constructed. The best object lesson road was privately funded by Coleman DuPont, heir to the eponymous chemical company. An MIT trained engineer, in 1911 he designed and funded a Grand Boulevard, much of which is now US 113, through his home state of Delaware. Notably, it included 61 meters, 200 feet, rights of way, passing lanes, bypasses around towns, and curves designed for the motor age. He donated the road to the state. Connecticut, for example, by the late 1890s was paving 130 kilometers of road per year and by 1905 had designated a network of 1,600 kilometers of state trunk highways. These new good roads made the automobile, which was much more sensitive to the vagaries of off-road conditions, feasible. Pope, the Dury brothers, and others advocated for more good roads to help promote the motor vehicle. One issue debated in the early 1900s was the emphasis to be given to business roads versus touring roads. Before the Model T, autos were expensive and used mainly by the upper classes. Touring was an important leisure time activity for the idle rich and those aspiring to that job. So they asked for touring roads, as did the automakers who thought touring roads would increase the market for vehicles. As less expensive vehicles came along, there was a great touring boom. Along with the development of national parks and as interest in the great outdoors increased, 
There was a strong basis for a touring road emphasis. The debate lasted about 10 years. The pragmatic business road concept won the day, although the business promoted was often tourism. Not only bicyclists and automakers were advocates for good roads. Perhaps the most famous advocate was the son of a road overseer for Washington Township, Missouri, Harry S. Truman, 1884 to 1972, assumed his father's role upon the latter's death in 1914, and served for another six months until politics turned him out of office. Harry Truman served as a Jackson County, Missouri judge, an administrative rather than judicial position, like a county commissioner, between 1922 and 1924, and again between 1927 and 1934. He ran on a platform of good roads and good management. In his Jackson County interregnum, he served as a salesman for the Kansas City Auto Club and as president of the National Old Trails Road Association, one of many road associations, like the Lincoln Highway Association, advocating for good roads. He is credited with bringing Jackson County out of the mud and establishing one of the best county road systems in the United States. Yet, despite his experiences with road building, it was not under President Truman that the Interstate Act was fully funded. While the plan was established by BPR engineers during his tenure as vice president and ratified by Congress in the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1944, almost no funds came with it. His presidency saw limited increases in highway funding, constrained both by the Korean War and by the fact that states could not spend the money that was already being raised. Seven point five discussion. The bicycle was one of many important building blocks in the automobile highway system. As a technology, it trained engineers who went on to more complex machinery. The metal tubing was an important input, as were the tires. The demands from bicyclists for good roads saw the creation of an infrastructure that was critical for the emergence of the automobile. The irony is the combination of good roads with adequate automobiles made life difficult for bicyclists, not just the on-road part, where there were natural conflicts between large motor vehicles and unprotected bicyclists, but also the expanded distances enabled by the automobile, making not having an auto that much more difficult. The engine was another critical aspect. The same debates at the turn of the 20th century about batteries versus petroleum are replaying at the onset of the 21st century. The same trade-offs are apparent. Although both technologies have advanced, nothing so much better has emerged to obviate the question.